This is CBC Here and Now. Graduation was supposed to be our time that got taken away from us. And now first semester, that was supposed to be our time, first year. I can sit here and complain about how crappy my internet is, but there's some people who don't have internet connection at all. With Munn's campus staying closed until January, students talk to us about what a virtual semester will mean for them. That story a little later on Here and Now. Good evening, I'm Carolyn Stokes. Well, now that we're in alert level four, some health care services are resuming. The province's four health boards say they'll focus on a gradual and safe ramp up. Here and now's Garrett Berry joins us live with those details. So Garrett, what types of procedures will be resuming? Yeah, all health boards, uh, all four health authorities rather, are really singing from the same tune today. Here is what they're going to start to roll out and resume. Uh, medical imaging, things like ultrasounds, endoscopies, cardiac diagnostic tests, you can think of an EKG or the dye tests, and urgent surgeries like surgeries for cancer and for heart surgery. That restart will be fairly slow. Uh, Minister Hagee said today that the surgery capacity will increase about 25% from what it was at alert level five. So obviously not every procedure is going to be done now that we've reached the next level, but they're still going to be focusing instead on the most urgent needs. And what we will initially be focusing on are those diagnostic procedures that are most likely to reveal uh, imminently treatable conditions that would otherwise pose a risk to health. We're thinking there are things like uh, endoscopies to, uh, to pick up uh, colon cancers. If you are waning on some of these services, the health board said today that they will be contacting you. And instead though, but if your health condition has changed and you should call your doctor and emergency rooms have remained open as well. In an emergency, go to the ER. Do not think that the emergency room is teeming with COVID. They have adequate protections in place, adequate precautions in place, adequate uh, personal protective equipment for both staff and for patients to protect them from that eventuality. If your medical condition is changing, contact your primary care provider. If it's urgent, go to the eMERGE. Okay, so Garrett, uh, do we know how many people are waiting for a call from their health board? We have asked for that data. We, we don't have it yet. The health minister said today, though, that there are 5,500 surgeries that have been put on hold since the coronavirus pandemic began. And obviously, that's just one type of procedure that people are waiting on. It will obviously be a very long process to get the numbers back down. And that's not really the goal here in alert level four. They're still focusing on high priority cases, as we mentioned, and trying to also maintain capacity in ICU beds if there is a surge or a spike in cases. Now, if you do get a call that your procedure has been rescheduled and to come back into the hospital, it will look very different. There's lots of precautions in place at the hospitals now to make sure that the disease is not spread inside their doors. So it's going to be a booked appointment. Appointments are going to be spread out so that we don't have multiple people in the waiting rooms. Waiting rooms are being changed so that people can't sit next to each other. And we'll be doing pre-screening of all individuals before they come to ensure they don't have any infectious symptoms. Looking towards the future now, Dr. Rashley says Western Health's next stage probably isn't going to be adding more types of procedures, but rather bringing more patients in on the procedures that they are already running now. Bring live for here now, I'm Garrett Barry in Gander. When massage therapists return to work, their practice will look and feel differently. The College of, the, uh, College of Massage Therapists regulates the province's 400 therapists, and it says there will be no skin-to-skin -skin contact. As here and now's Heather Gillis reports, it, it's a decision that has massage therapists divided. Hi, hey, Michael. Just gonna drape your for massage therapists returning to work could be risky. Their job requires close contact with people, making physical distancing to prevent COVID-19 impossible. The College of Massage Therapists has released strict new requirements for members to follow when businesses are allowed to reopen in the coming weeks. In the first of three phases, there'll be no skin-to-skin -skin contact. 
therapists must wear surgical masks, a face shield or goggles, a gown and gloves. They'll change their personal protective equipment between appointments and clients must wear a non-medical mask before entering the clinic and throughout treatment. As a college, we do understand that our guidelines are pretty stringent, they're pretty strong, um, but we do take public safety very seriously. The future looks very uncertain for massage therapy to me. But this massage therapist says she can't adhere to those guidelines or treat clients wearing gloves. She's concerned about wearing all that protective gear during a session. But to do an entire treatment with gloves on, I wouldn't be able to do it. I don't feel you can feel what you need to feel. And I haven't been given any training on how to put on all this garb and then take it off uh, safely. Despite Sarah Sexton's concerns, Carolyn Staple with the Massage Therapists Association says they're on side with the guidelines. We have in place the absolute best um, precautions. Staple says it's better to overprotect, then relax rules later. Any therapist is very familiar with providing treatment fully clothed. So although it means that we can't do skin on skin gliding with lotion, there's still lots of beneficial type of techniques and treatments that we can do. Meanwhile, the college says if members don't follow the rules, they could be suspended or reported to the health department. Heather Gillis, CBC News, St. John's. The RCMP is now looking for witnesses in Monday night's fatal crash on Topsail Road in St. John's. Two people died when a black Kia Soul collided with several vehicles and a motorcycle that were stopped at a red light on Topsail Road. The province's new serious incident response team is involved in the investigation because a police car was pursuing the Kia shortly before the crash. The 25-year-old driver of that vehicle died. A 44-year-old man who was driving a motorcycle stopped at a red light was also killed. Investigators want anyone who witnessed the crash or who has dash cam video to contact them. The province's Oil Industry Association is anxiously awaiting news of possible help from Ottawa to deal with the fallout of COVID-19. Noya CEO Charlene Johnson says it's a critical time. More than half of their member companies have laid off employees, and Noya is planning a town hall meeting for tomorrow afternoon. It has been a death by a thousand cuts. Our members are really worried about survival. Um, the outlook is very bleak and uh, we're really in crisis mode. We need help now and we need help for many of our member companies. The federal natural resources minister says Ottawa is focusing on incentives based on exploration to help out. But Seamus O'Regan could not comment to a timeline saying those details have yet to be finalized. Oil is just one part of our province's economy that's feeling the effects of the pandemic. Here and now we'll have more business stories in a series called Changing Course in the coming days and weeks. Tonight, Here and Now continues the conversation about intimate partner violence in the province. We have the story of Melissa Gulliver. She was assaulted by a boyfriend, but before that happened, there was something Gulliver didn't know. The boyfriend had been convicted of doing the same thing before. And there is another twist to that story. Arianna Kelland has the details. Whoa, what are you doing? Melissa Gulliver is living her life working through trauma suffered at the hands of her ex. Ashton Kennedy admitted in court last summer that he assaulted her, but stopped showing up soon after. A warrant was issued, but 10 months later, he still hasn't been arrested. Throughout this process, I realized that it's not a justice system. It's a legal system. It's a court system. Gulliver began dating Kennedy in 2018, and she says the new romance quickly turned volatile. Driving was his main thing. That was his sense of control, because he's the one behind the driver's seat. He's the one exhilarating. He's the one swerving in and out of traffic. He's the one, you know, hitting his own body up against the steering wheel, his head off the dashboard. I was afraid for my life. In December 2018, problems became too severe to forget, too severe for the couple's upstairs neighbors to ignore. Angry over text messages Gulliver sent a female friend, Kennedy flew into a rage. 
he stood up um, from the bed and he just pushed me. And I looked at him and I said, you're, you can psycho. And then he slapped me across the face and then he got on the bed and he slapped me again. Her neighbors called police. The officer told me then, he said, just so you're aware, there is another file on him from a previous relationship. I was not aware. Before Gulliver, there was Hillary Upshaw. Kennedy had assaulted Upshaw, pleaded guilty, and went to family violence intervention court. That's the same court he ended up in for his assault on Melissa Gulliver. But this time, he stopped showing up, and police say they can't find him. There is new legislation pending that could have helped Melissa Gulliver know more. Clear's law will allow police officers to disclose an offender's criminal record of domestic violence, and Gulliver is all for it. You have a criminal record. Um, you can't try and hide from it. And this Clear's law makes them not be able to hide from it because they're able to warn the next person. Gulliver says she's picked up the pieces of what was broken during her short but harrowing relationship. As she moves on, she hopes Kennedy does too by making the step to face the consequences of his actions. Arianna Kelland, CBC News, St. John's. The College of the North Atlantic is planning to offer most of its courses online for the fall term. The college released its fall term plan online, which outlines the plan for each course offered at the various campuses. The college says it's mainly using an online model for most courses, but there are some exceptions in the health sciences and industrial trades programs. Courses with practical hands-on components will take place on campus, depending Depending on public health regulations at the time. Meanwhile, Munn announced yesterday that there won't be any in-person on-campus courses before January except for students in medicine, pharmacy and nursing. But that leaves all other students with a lot of questions and concerns about online instruction. This afternoon, I spoke with a high school graduate in Gander who's disappointed about missing the first year on-campus experience. And I also spoke with a third-year student from Labrador who's worried about the quality of online Online learning. In September I was planning on attending Memorial and uh, I was going to stay in residence for at least the first two semesters if I like it I'll stay longer but not being able to go in September is a huge disappointment. So I'm a, a third year student at the university. I'm a second year biology major and neuroscience major. Um, I'm from Labrador, the south coast of Labrador. So I moved to St. John's two years ago to start my degree. Um, when I got the call that the university was closing in the winter semester, I went from studying to my midterms to just complete standstill, packing my bags, came home. Graduation was supposed to be our time that got taken away from us and now first semester that was supposed to be our time first year fresh graduates where that's being taken from us as well and it's just it's it's really sad as a science student i have a lot of uh, physical hands-on labs i have about i'd say 20 hours of in-person labs per week so um there's no way to you know teach practical skills effectively in my opinion without actually being there to do the hands-on work. So that's my biggest concern with starting my courses in the fall. I, I pay, you know, thousands a year to this university expecting to get a hands-on education with professors in front of me who I can go speak to and, and meet with. So it's going to be difficult to justify why I'm paying the same amount of money to my tuition for, you know, not as good a quality of education. People pay less for online education for that reason, for the convenience, but it's not the same thing. You can't say it is. You know, building a relationship with your professors and faculty is essential. Them teaching us remotely, that doesn't replace being able to be there in person and being able to ask them questions and ask them how their day was and get to know them. It's been a pretty uh, t tough balance. I have really crappy Labrador internet, so um, it's going to be really interesting to see how this all plays out. I can sit here and complain about how crappy my internet is, but there's some people who don't have internet connection at all. So are these people going to be forced out of MUN for next semester because of the lack of access to technology? I was looking forward to meeting a whole bunch of new friends because people say that the friends you make in university and residence last a lifetime, not being able to be part of that. For like a for a whole semester, maybe two semesters. It's it's just it's 
it's disappointing on a lot of levels. I think they definitely made this decision with the public's best interests at heart, not, you know, just the students and the education aspect of it. We got to think about the students that are coming from you know, all over Canada, all over the world, and Newfoundland students as well. Like, we, we don't know how this is going to, if we're going to have a MUN cluster like we have with the college cluster. And I think that that was way too big a risk to take. So even though this is, you know, three, four months down the road, it, it definitely had to be made soon, and I think it was the right call. Welcome back to Here and Now. Another good sign heading into the May 24th weekend, no new cases of COVID-19. This holiday weekend will be different than in the past. Today, the Premier and Health Minister said they have plans to stay home and maybe enjoy some outdoor activities. Dr. Janice Fitzgerald offered some advice about how you should spend this long weekend. We would encourage activities that, um, you know, are within your bubble, uh, whether that's uh, your own household bubble or expanded bubble. Uh, and uh, some outdoor activities that you would do in that situation would be fine. So um, hiking or um, getting out for a bike ride or something along those lines. 
Um, if within your bubble you want to do something at home, uh, that will be fine as well. Uh, but you know, it's really about trying to keep yourself uh, safe as you can within your bubble and uh, trying to get out and enjoy the fresh air if we get any and no snow. We know it's 2 4, so <laughs> could be anything. <laughs> So true. Well, for many, the May 24th weekend is the unofficial start to summer and the tourism season. But as we've been hearing over the past several weeks, this year's season is going to look different. Chris O'Neill Yates has this look at boat tours from Bay Bulls. This is an unusual sight in May. No lineups. The tourists won't be here this year to marvel at the icebergs on their annual migration. But Loyola and Joe O'Brien have weathered hard times before, like when the cod fishery collapsed in 1992. I remember uh, the last day fishing at uh, Cape St. Mary's. Uh, our father had said, uh, you know, if Loyola, if Cape St. Mary's fails, get out. And that was when I said, you're going to have to do something different. With a bird sanctuary on their doorstep, they made the jump from the fishing boat to the tour boat. Tourism draws half a million visitors here every year, employing 20,000 people. Tourists spend over a billion dollars a year. But with the provincial borders closed to COVID-19, the money that the tourists would ordinarily bring leaves a huge hole, says Joe O'Brien. The young people who depended on the restaurant jobs in the summertime, the tour guiding jobs in our company working in the service sector, these are the ones that are going to be mostly impacted. Some tourist operations may not survive this crisis, but the O'Briens are determined to see the other side of this. And unlike the cod, the whales and the icebergs will return. Chris O'Neill Yates, CBC News, Bay Bulls, Newfoundland. This weather update is brought to you by the Healthcare Foundation Home Lottery. Bonus deadline is midnight Friday. Order tickets now at hcfhomelottery.ca. Another winter wonderland up through parts of Labrador or most of Labrador today. Let's take a look at those temperatures. Quite uh, chilly as well, only sitting around 3 degrees as your afternoon high in Happy Valley Goose Bay. Along the coast, though, those temperatures are a little bit cooler, 0 degrees in Hopedale. And then we've got those temperatures in the single digits. Not really moving much the last couple of days uh, across the island. 7 degrees in St. John's. Uh, five in St. Anthony and a similar temperature for Porta Basque today. Now, if we take a look at that area of low pressure, it's just spinning over us and it's bringing that colder air to the north and then uh, that onshore flurry activity is happening along the west coast. Now, near the surface that's falling is rain, snow or a wet snow. And that's generally going to continue as we head through the overnight tonight. So you can see that potential for snow along the west coast going to stay unsettled really across the island with the potential for a few showers in the mix and these winds are going to stay breezy and unfortunately they're going to stay breezy for the next couple of days i don't really see any relief from these winds until at least friday once that area of low pressure moves offshore so we will be under the influence for the next couple of days that snow will continue for mainly northern portions of labrador the heavy snow anyway and then through central we're seeing uh, some mixing with some rain today but we do still have those winter storm warnings in place for Hopedale to Makovic and then Nain, mainly near the Natwashish area is where we're seeing the majority of the snowfall and then note that special weather statement along the west coast that's because we're going to see uh, some snow which will be pretty significant in the higher elevations and further inland now this takes us through to tomorrow morning you can see some areas seeing uh, 10 to as much as 15 centimeters of snow and then that snow continues through the day on Thursday, bringing accumulations to potentially 20 to 25 centimeters in those areas near the coast. You're looking at about 5 to 10, again, falling tonight through the day on Thursday. So there's that uh, snow I was talking about that will continue tomorrow stays unsettled with the chance of either flurries or showers right across the board. The chance of a few peaks of sun, just like today for the Avalon, but again, some flurry activity potentially late day and through the overnight but again those winds will stay pretty brisk temperatures not moving much from today within a few degrees and then up through labrador similar temperatures one to three degrees will be your afternoon highs now into friday again that low still very much under the influence of so we're looking at the potential of either showers or flurries through the day some sunshine possible along the south coast and then as we look into towards the weekend, it does look like, although all not overly warm, 
Uh, we should see some sunshine both Sunday and Monday, so that's good news. Uh, temperatures for western and central Newfoundland uh, flirting with the double digits, it looks like at this point. Some sunshine for the west and then keeping that chance of showers in for the uh, central areas. And then for Labrador, again, temperatures sitting around uh, 8, 9 degrees by the time the weekend rolls around. So that's certainly good news, going to melt some of that snow. And then for Western Labrador, you're looking at the potential for some flurries. So just wanted to share this great shot from Larry Scott, a uh, grand lake view from the trail. Thank you so much for sending that in. If you have any weather photos to share with us, send them to nlphotos at cbc.ca. Welcome back to Here and Now. Well, the traffic lights are coming back to Rollins Cross in St. John's on Friday morning. City Council voted to restore the lights after complaints from pedestrians saying they feel unsafe. The intersection was turned into a roundabout nearly two years ago as part of a pilot project. A report found there were actually fewer accidents as a roundabout than with traffic lights, but council still decided to put the lights back in. Well, that's it for us tonight. Thank you so much for sharing part of your evening with us. Hope to see you again tomorrow. Coming up next is CBC News from Nova Scotia. Good night.